بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, So today inshallah ta'ala we will uh, move on from the battle of Uhud We have finished the battle of Uhud uh, in our last few sessions And uh, move on to the next two major incidents uh, Both of which were uh, very sad. They caused the Prophet ﷺ a lot of grief and a lot of personal loss because they both involved massacres. They both involved uh, large groups of the Sahaba being brutally killed. And these are called the incident of Bi'ir Ma'una and the incident of Ar Raji'. Bi'ir Ma'una and Ar Raji'. So, what exactly happened? Uh, it appears that the apparent, let's say, loss of Uhud, or at least the Muslims were not the clear victors, it actually made some of the Bedouin tribes around Medina greedy. That it appeared that now they would be, they'll be able to attack Medina. And remember that Bedouins, by and large, they would earn their income by raids. That's the primary source of income is by raiding and by simply stealing. This was the way of the desert. And also, there also appears to have been now the beginnings of religious animosity. We've seen this a little bit at Uhud, and now it's going to go more and more, where it is becoming a war against Islam and Shirk, whereas before it was a war basically uh, between the Muslims and Quraysh. Now it is becoming into an all-out war. And a number of small skirmishes took place, some of which don't really have much significance. Uh, of them is a very small skirmish. It didn't have any significance. Now, it will have later on, uh, that the Muslims uh, attacked uh, a small tribe of the Banu Asad, and their leader was Tulayha al-Asadi. And Tulayha al-Asadi was one of those who declared himself to be a false prophet. After the Prophet ﷺ uh, passed away, he's one of those 30 Dajjals. So this loss basically was one of the main incentives that he's wanting to get his revenge. So after the Prophet ﷺ passed away, Tulayh al-Asadi was one of those who later proclaimed uh, prophethood. Uh, but this is a small incident. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ sent 150 people and uh, he was the conqueror over them. But it l basically caused Tulayh to flip and become very uh, angry and he had this animosity until he announced his prophethood. Uh, the main two stories as we said are ar rajia and Ma'una. And let us begin with ar rajia And some say ar rajia and some say ar rajia And it is called ar rajia because that is the name of the well around which the massacre uh, took place. And Ma'una is the name of the other well. They're both wells. ar rajia and Ma'una, they're both wells. Uh, and what happened was uh, the beginnings of Ar-Rajia actually go back a little bit. We need to uh, go back a little bit. The tribe of Hudayl, which was one of the large Bedouin tribes in the north, had started planning an attack on Medina. And their chieftain, Abdullah ibn Unais al-Juhani, Abdullah ibn Unais al-Juhani, the chieftain of the uh, Hudayl, uh, sorry, excuse me, Abdullah ibn Unais is a sahabi, my mistake, uh, Khalid ibn Sufyan, Al-Hudhali, the, the chieftain of the Hudayl. Abdullah ibn Unais is the Sahabi. Scratch that. Khalid ibn Sufyan al-Hudhali, the chieftain of the Hudayl, he began gathering a small army to surprise attack Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ then decided to preemptively attack him and execute him. So that the whole plan basically is dismissed. So he, uh, he chose Abdullah ibn Unais al-Juhani. He's the Sahabi. He chose Abdullah ibn Unais al-Juhani to basically hunt down uh, Khalid ibn Sufyan and get rid of him so that no longer can he gather an army. So this was going to be a one-man show. You just go and you cut off the head. This is not a large expedition. This is a very dangerous expedition. It's a one-man show. You go, you get rid of this guy so that there is no uh, army going to attack. And so he said, you will find him in the valley of Arana. Allah told him, you will find him in the valley of Arana. Right now go and you will meet him there. Few guards, you know, it's a good time. Now is the time to strike. Allah Azza wa Jal told him. And so he said, O Messenger of Allah, what does he look like? I've never seen him. Now the Prophet had also never seen him. The Prophet had never seen him. So he said, When you see him, you shall feel more terrified than you've ever been at anybody's appearance. So this is like, the, the, you can imagine the Bedouin, uh, typical uh, chieftain of a Bedouin, who um, has no sense of hygiene, no sense of anything. He's living a very rough, very crude life, and he looks the part of, a, of an evil, if you like, you know, Bedouin chieftain, right? So he said, when you see him, you will feel terrified. That is his sign. 
Now the Prophet had not seen him either. But obviously Jibreel had told him of this. And so he said, I only took my sword because this is a a top secret mission if you like. He's not going to take an army. I only took my sword and I headed towards the valley of uh, Arana. And he said, when I saw him in the distance, and he's quoting first hand, I had never been as terrified of anybody's shakal as this man's. Like he looks like a devil. He looks evil. And you know, there are people like this, you know. Uh, he looks evil, just looking at him. So he said, Sadaq Allah wa Rasuluhu. Allah and the Messenger have spoken the truth that this is the real, uh, you know, uh, perception that happened. And then an interesting thing happened. He said that, now he's seeing him far away in the distance. And it's time, it doesn't say for what salah, we're assuming it's asr, but it doesn't say what. So, in which book did you read Dhuhr in? Ibn Ishaq says Zuhr. Okay, Jayit, I did not see Zuhr in the book that I read. Okay, so Ibn Ishaq says Zuhr, but then why didn't he do Jum'ah then if that is Zuhr? In any case, okay. Uh, so he says he saw him in the distance, and because he was worried that the time would basically go away, he prayed as he was walking to the chieftain. And he just made gestures with his head. Awma Abi He just made gestures with his head. And he therefore prayed the first time in Islamic history, the first time ever, a type of salah that was later called one version of Salat al-Khawf. This is one version. Salat al-Khawf has many versions. right? This is one version of Salat al-Khawf where if you cannot even stop and face the Qibla and say Allahu Akbar, you just pray as you are, as he's walking, he's praying. And this is the first time ever in Islamic history that this uh, salah had ever been prayed. So he made an ishtihad as we're going to come back to this and he walked all the way there. And then he got close to uh, Khalid ibn Sufyan and he found out is this the person? Are you actually gathering an army? Let me also join your army. So basically he's making sure this is the guy. He gives the impression that you don't have anything to be worried about. And then when the time was right, khalas, he got rid of him. So this was a time when his people were not around him. He was basically alone in the valley with a few people. And that's exactly what the Prophet wasallam knew. That at this time is his vulnerability time. So uh, Abdullah ibn Unais then immediately came back. And as soon as the Prophet ﷺ saw him, he said, uh, may your face be successful, meaning it's clear you have come back uh, successful. And he made dua for him and he gifted him a staff. He gifted him a staff. And he said, this shall be the sign between me and you on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. This shall be a sign between me and you on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Meaning you're going to basically get some privilege or something. And so Abdullah ibn Unais, he forever always had this staff with him in peace and in war, in battle and in the house. He never ever uh, let this staff out of his sight. And when he died, he commanded that he gave the wasiyah that the staff be buried with him in his uh, qabr. Now, obviously from this incident, it's going to lead to a raji'ah. What's going to happen is going to lead to a raji'ah. This incident, we learn two things. Obviously, it goes without saying the miracle of the process and by describing him and by telling where he is. All of this is clear that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed the Prophet of this. And also that he chose the right person for the job. That he chose the right person. Abdullah bin Unais was the right person to basically uh, go in in this, in this way. And he managed to ingratiate himself. He managed to make himself feel comfortable and then immediately got rid of him. Uh, another interesting thing that we learned from this incident is that the Sahaba made ijtihad about fiqh even during the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. So even during the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, he, they made ijtihad. And this is a clear evidence that, and this is well known that there are a number of sahaba, they would make ijtihad. And this shows us the legal permissibility of making ijtihad. Even when the Prophet ﷺ is alive, ijtihad was done. And when he would hear of the ijtihad, sometimes he would affirm it, and sometimes he would uh, fine-tune it or change it. So for example, it is said that Ammar ibn Yasir, when he fell uh, junub in the desert, and he did not have any water, what did he do? He made ijtihad and qiyas. And he said, well, if we do tayammum for wudu, I guess we're going to have to do tayammum for ghusl as well. So he took all of his clothes off, he's alone in the desert, and he rolled around in the sand. He rolled around in the sand. And then he came back and he told the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ laughed and said, all you needed to do was this. And he showed him how to do tayammum. But what does this show? Ijtihad was done. 
Ijtihad was done, and this shows us the legal permissibility of extrapolating what we know of the Qur'an and Sunnah to cater to a situation that the Qur'an and Sunnah does not tell us about. Right? This is called ijtihad. Right? And therefore this shows us the basis of our religion being applicable in all times and place through the medium of ijtihad. Now, this occurred in Muharram of the fourth year of the Hijrah. Okay? So Muharram of the fourth year of the Hijrah, basically a few months after Uhud. So what happened? They've just killed their chieftain. So what did they do? The tribe of Hudayl resorted to a very dirty tactic, a very evil tactic, in order to get revenge. They contacted two other tribes, Udal and Qarra, Udal and Qarra. And they paid them some money to set up a trap. Right, this is now a blatant, if you like, uh, tactic to get the Muslims to kill them, to set up a trap. And it involved a simple plot. And that plot was, you guys pretend to accept Islam, go to Medina, pretend to be Muslims, and then beg the Prophet ﷺ to send you teachers, the most qualified, to come back and teach you the religion. Because they knew that the Sahaba loved to go and teach. And that the Prophet ﷺ would send teachers, Qur'an teachers, Salah teachers to the people. And so, Udal and Qarra, the both of them sent their delegations, and they insisted to get as many of the teachers that the Prophet ﷺ could uh, afford to send. And so, between 7 and 10, most likely 10 people, they volunteered for this task under the leadership of Asim ibn Thabit. Asim ibn Thabit. And when they got to the well of Ar-Raji'ah, this is why it is called the incident of Ar-Raji'ah, when they got to the well of Ar-Raji'ah, a hundred warriors ambushed them. There are only seven or ten people, a hundred people now surround them, and they realize this is a trap. They realize this was a setup, this was not, not an actual, uh, an actual uh, sincere con- conversion. And when they saw the hundred people coming in the distance, they managed to take shelter uh, in a small hill, they managed to take shelter on the top of a hill, and they pulled out their bows and arrows, because bows and arrows is what you can use for far distance, and none of these guys wants to lose their lives, right? Bows and arrows, they don't want to lose their lives by coming up, but in the end, when you have a hundred people surrounded by ten, eventually, what is going to happen? Now, this, the plot thickens in that, their leader, Asim, their leader, Asim, he had uh, killed in... in uh, in the, uh, in the battle of Uhud, he had killed the husband of a certain lady by the name of Sulafa. Okay? Sulafa bin Tisad. So, Sulafa, she's obviously a pagan, Sulafa had promised Halaf that she is going to drink wine from the skull of Asim. That I am not going to die until I drink wine from the skull of Asim. And in her vengeance, she had said, anybody who brings me the skull of Asim, 100 camels. 100 camels. Anybody who brings me the skull of Asim, 100 camels. And Asim knows that the tribe has some personal animosity as well because of this. And so he made, uh, uh, he, he cried out and he made a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, he said, I am not going to surrender to them because I know what they're going to do to my body. I am not going to surrender. I'm going to fight to the death. And, O oh Allah, inform our Prophet wasallam about us that we were sincere. That we didn't die cowards. We were sincere. Inform our Prophet wasallam about us. And he said, O oh Allah, as I protected your religion in the daytime, now protect my body at night. Meaning, as I'm fighting now in the daytime, when night falls, protect my body. Right? So he's saying, Oh Allah, as I protected your religion, by dying for your cause, by being sincere, now, O oh Allah, it's your responsibility to protect my body. I don't want my skull to be used as a wine casket for this uh, lady. And he fought with his bows and arrows until he ran out of bows. And then he fought with his spear until the spear broke. And then he fought with his sword until the sword became dull. He fought a brave battle. And eventually, obviously, what is going to happen when you're surrounded by 10 to 1? Eventually, he uh, died. And... When he died after the battle was over, we're going to come back to the battle. After the battle was over, uh, everybody rushed to get his body. Number one body they want is his. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a swarm of wasps came. A swarm of wasps came, 
and they would sting everybody, just attack their face, anybody who came close. So they said, what do we do? So they said, okay, wait, wasps don't hang around at night. Just wait in night and then we'll get the body at night. And so they waited until uh, dusk, until the sun fell, until the sun set. And then subhanAllah, out of nowhere, a river just came. Out of nowhere. And it had not rained. And there was no river over there. And his body was on top of a hill. Still, out of nowhere, a river just came gushing out. And it went straight to his body, picked his body up and carried it off into the distance. And nobody knows to this day where he is buried. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took care of his burial. Allah Azza wa Jal took care of his burial. So this is Asim, the leader, he died uh, a shaheed. Back to the battle. So they killed, we don't, we don't know whether there were seven or ten people total, but they killed everybody down to the last three. So if there were ten, they killed seven. Uh, so they killed everybody down to the last three, and the last three are now surrounded by this hundred. And they said, okay, look, just surrender now. Okay, there's no point moving on, just surrender. Now why were they interested in surrendering? Because they're not going to get any money for a dead body other than Asim's body. They will get money for a living body. They will get ransom. They will get, uh, they can sell it to uh, the Quraysh and that's exactly what they did, right? So they promised, they said, if you surrender, we'll protect you, we'll, you know, nothing's going to happen to you. But this is lying. But of course, at the time, the three sahaba don't know this. So they promised them, don't worry, as long as you surrender, khalas, okay, we won, uh, we promise you, aman, we give you safety if you surrender. And the three of them decided to surrender at that time. When seven had died, they decided to surrender. And they were Khubayb and Zayd and Abdullah ibn Tariq. Khubayb and Zayd and Abdullah ibn Tariq. So the three of them came down from the hill, and immediately they jumped on them and tied them up like animals. And Abdullah ibn Tariq said, this is the first sign of treachery. They didn't mean to give us security. They tied us up and they put us onto a stick, just like an animal. They're going to do like, this is the first sign of treachery. And so he refused to become a prisoner of war. He refused to walk and march. He refused every commandment. And so they just killed him on the side of the road. He just would not budge. And so they just killed him right then and there. As for the and so this is Abdullah ibn Tariq, he's gone. So Khubayb and Zayd are left. As for the other two, they found out who wanted to purchase them. And Khubayb was purchased by the tribe of Banu Harith because he had killed one of the Banu Harith in the in the Battle of Badr. And Zayd had been one of those who had attacked. Umayyah ibn Khalaf, the master of Bilal. Remember the story of Bilal? That when Bilal said, Wallahi ma najotu in naja, I am not going to live if this guy lives. And the, he was surrounded by a group. So Zayd was one of those who surrounded Umayyah. Right, so he's one of those who then killed Umayyah. Umayyah did not die by one person, it was a, a, a group that came. So Zayd was one of them. So Safwan ibn Umayyah in Mecca, purchased him from this Bedouin tribe for a large sum of money in order to kill him for having killed or having been one of the people who killed his father. And so the both of them became prisoners just to be executed in a short period of time. The both of them, Khubayb and Zayd. And the both of them are, many stories are mentioned uh, about them. As for Khubayb, uh, he, re- he remained a prisoner uh, amongst them, amongst the Banu Harith, uh, until they announced that uh, they would kill him. And so he asked uh, for a shower to take a clean, uh, to take a ghusl, and he asked for uh, a razor to get rid of his hair, uh, the, uh, the, the, the pubic hair and whatnot, to basically meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clean, right? And so they allowed him this. And they gave him a, a, a bath, they allowed him to take a bath, they gave him a razor. And as he was sitting there with the razor in his hand, one of the Babies crawled up to him and came right up to him. And the mother, when she saw from the distance that my baby is now with him, she cried out in fear that, oh my God, now he's going to die and he might kill my baby as retaliation before he leaves. And so Khubayb said, are you scared that I will kill this child? Wallahi, I will never do something like this. Wallahi, I will never do something like this. And the same mother later on said, I have never seen any prisoner more noble than him in his akhlaq and his manners. And I saw him tied up in his chains, eating from a bunch of grapes. And wallahi, there was no bunch of grapes in Makkah at the time. 
I saw him eating from bunches of grapes out of nowhere because they were starving him. Obviously, they weren't treating him you know, with the Geneva Conventions, right? So he was eating out of grapes and there were no grapes in all of Mecca. And he, there he is eating out of grapes and it was sustenance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him. And uh, when they brought him on to be killed, he said, allow me to pray two rak'at. And he prayed two rak'at and then when he finished, he said, were it not for the fact that you'd think that I'm being cowardly, I would have prayed a longer two rak'ah, but I don't want you to think that I'm scared of that. So that's why it was so short. And Khubayb was the first one who started the sunnah of the one that is to be executed praying two rak'at. Right? And this is also ishtihad from the Sahaba that later on was accepted. Right? He was the one who started the sunnah that any Muslim who is going to be executed by any, for whatever reason, it is sunnah for them to pray two rak'ah. Uh, and so you can say there is tahiyya of execution. Right? There is tahiyya of execution that may Allah Azza wa save me and you from ever having to offer that. But it is sunnah in our religion. That, and this is a sunnah that obviously the Prophet approved in his lifetime that uh, Khubayb prayed in this manner. As for Zayd, of course he is back with Abu Sufyan and he is back with uh, Safwan ibn Umayyah. Right? And so he's with the leaders of the Quraysh because Umayyah is one of their leaders. So as for Zayd, they really made a big festival out of killing him. The whole people of Mecca, they took a day off to torture him and to kill him. This is a day of happiness now that they're killing one of the Muslims, right? And uh, Abu Sufyan, and this is the famous incident that all of you know, this is when it happens now. The famous story back and forth and the famous response that everybody knows, every child knows. Abu Sufyan said, when he was tied up and when he's about to be lanced you know, to death, Abu Sufyan said in front of everybody, he asks him, that unashiduk Allah, I ask you by Allah, tell me the honest truth. Don't you wish right now that Muhammad wasallam was in your place and you are with your family and children? And he gave that honest response that he has nothing to lose or win by lying or, or, or you know, he has nothing. He's gonna die, khalas. Right? But he said with that iman that only a Muslim can have. That he said, Wallahi, I would rather die like this than that the Prophet ﷺ get a thorn prick right now where he's sitting. I would rather die like this to save him from a thorn prick, much less he be in my place. And Abu Sufyan said that I have never seen any leader that is more beloved to his people than Muhammad ﷺ is with his companions. No leader is more beloved to his people than the Sahaba respect the Prophet ﷺ. And he's not the only one to say this, right? Every single non-Muslim who witnessed the respect that the Sahaba gave to the Prophet ﷺ, they themselves narrated it. And this is not from the Sahaba. The Sahaba did not narrate themselves. Rather, we learned this from the non-Muslim uh, at, at the time. Obviously, Abu Sufyan later became a Muslim uh, about how much respect they gave to the Prophet ﷺ. From this incident, we learn many things. Of them is that in such situations between any, uh, what was happening in a Rajay right now, should you surrender, should you fight on, we see that permissibility has been given for both. Permissibility has been given for, for both, and whichever one a person chooses, inshallah, there is precedent in that. And it depends on the individual circumstance which one is more better and honorable. And all of them are ma'jur, all of them are rewarded for what they have done. Also we learn here from Abdullah ibn Tariq who refused to budge and he knew he was going to die. We learn here an interesting point. It is not considered suicide to do something that you know will cause your death as long as it is at the hands of somebody else. Because he knows, I mean there's no question, you know, you're, you're being told to march and you're not going to march. What are they going to do? They're not going to let you ride the camel and they're going to walk, obviously, right? He knows what's going to happen. So this is not considered suicide because he didn't do it himself. They're doing it and he's not going to be tortured there. Might as well be tortured here and get it over with, right? And so this also shows us that it is not considered suicide. If the enemy, if you do something knowing the enemy is going to kill you, and we have lots of incidents in the battles of the Sahaba that they acted, some can say bravely, and others that are non-Muslims will say foolishly, but we believe bravely that they wanted to do something that 
uh, many people would not do if they didn't have iman. Sometimes they lost in, uh, in this world, they became shahid in the next, and sometimes they uh, won in that particular tactic. Another thing that we uh, see, and this is something we firmly believe in as well, the concept of karamat. The concept of karamat. And karamat means a mini miracle. Karamat is something that is given to the non-prophets. Prophets are given mu'jiza. Other than prophets are given karamat. And karamat are things that Allah blesses the believers of a prophet with. And we see many karamats in the seerah, and here are two right now. That the body of Asim, how it was protected. Right? By the wasps, and then by, just out of nowhere, a river comes, literally out of nowhere, and then it actually goes to the top of the hill. Can you imagine? Right? It just goes to the top and then takes the body away. This is a karama. And to this day, nobody knows where he is buried. And also, of course, uh, khubayb and food appearing out of nowhere. Uh, obviously, this is another karama. And uh, I have given many uh, uh, Many times in this masjid I've t- spoken about the difference between mu'jizah and karama and sihr. I've spoken about this multiple times um, here. And we did this as well when we, ta- when we did Surah Yusuf as well. We did as well what is the difference between this and that. Uh, and so no need to repeat over here. Uh, also we see over here the love that the, pro- that the sahaba had for not just the process obviously, but even for following the sunnah. Up until the time of their death. Like he's about to die, what does he want to do? Take a ghusl and purify himself. Have a clean body. SubhanAllah. Look at where his mind is now. Right? He's not worried about wasiyah and my children. No, he knows he's going to meet Allah. Let me meet Allah in a pure state. Let me do ghusl, let me clean my body. So look at the concern they have for the uh, sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And of course, ask for the love for the Prophet And We already see Khubayb is saying, I'd rather, you know, I'd rather die this death than even a thorn prick him. And we know he means it because he has nothing to gain right now. Right? He's, he's saying he will die rather than a thorn pricking him. This is the height of love. We also see over here, as I said, the sunnah of praying to Raka'ah before execution. And then uh, one last point before we move on. That treachery and killing innocents and killing children and women is never something that our religion allows. That this man is about to die, and he's going to die anyway. Many people would say, you know what, let me just get rid of as much of them as I can. right? And this was the innocent child, that he could have taken the razor and uh, harmed the child, or worse than that. But he was shocked when the mother screamed. And he couldn't believe that the mother would think that I would do this. So he's asking a rhetorical question. Do you think that I'm going to harm this child? It's as if he's insulted, even though he's the prisoner, and he's going to be executed, he feels insulted. That do you really think I'm going to harm this innocent child? La wallahi, I would never do anything like that. Right? He's consoling the mother that calm down, and he's the one going to be killed. This is what Iman brings about. And this clearly shows us that the killing of innocents, and especially women and children, as we know our sharia is very uh, explicit and clear about this point. Now, the second incident that occurred, and what made this especially traumatic, was the two incidents occurred at the same time. So much so that according to one report, our Prophet got the news of both of them on the same night. And this is why this was doubly traumatic for him, right? So it's happening in the same time frame. And that is a tragedy that in terms of quantity is much worse than ar raji And that is the well of Ma'una, Bi'ir Ma'una, the well of Ma'una. And this was one of the worst massacres to occur in the seerah of the Prophet wasallam, a cold-blooded massacre that is almost, uh, actually it is unparalleled in the seerah. A, a massacre like this, it is unparalleled in the seerah. And the story goes as follows, with regards to the Bi'r Ma'una. The Bi'r Ma'una, uh, around this time, one of the famous chieftains of Najd came down to Medina. And Najd, as you know, is northern Arabia. And Najd has a whole bunch of tribes that we are not that familiar with hearing. Because again, Najd is different. We're used to hearing the tribes uh, around Mecca and Medina. This is the Hijaz. Najd has a whole other group. And uh, they also have very different... uh, They were known for many things. And of the things they were known for, they are not as civilized as the Hijazis. This was the perception that was given. That there are people of the Bedouin. There are people that are not of the cities. This was the perception at the time of the people of uh, Najd. And uh, one of the chieftains of Najd 
by the name of Abu al-Bara Amir ibn Malik, we'll call him Abu al-Bara. Abu al-Bara came to Medina, and he stayed for a while, and he was very impressed with Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ tried his best to cause him to convert, but he was hesitant. So he was thinking about it, but he hadn't made up his mind. He was hesitant. So he said, O Muhammad ﷺ, if only you were to send a group of your companions to the people of Najd and call them to this matter, I'm pretty sure that a lot of them would respond to your call. So send us your people and we will go and spread your message. So uh, Abu al-Bara guaranteed protection for du'at in the Najd region. So it's as if he's saying, I'll open up the doors for Muslims to give da'wah. Right? He didn't accept. But he is saying, you have my word. And he was an honest man, as we'll see, like later on we'll come back to this, that uh, he was not lying. He gave a genuine word, that from my side, you have my word, as one of the main chieftains. And how does the system work back then? That everybody who's allied with a tribe, if one of the tribes gives protection, all of the allies automatically must give protection. This is the way it works back then. This is what we call hulafa or halif, right? That your halif, you have a treaty. So X and Y have a treaty. If X extends protection to Z, Y also has to protect Z. This is the way it worked back then, and uh, it is something that is still common in many uh, places around the world, this type of system. So he is saying that I have an alliance with all of the people of Najd, and my protection should be good enough because I am a senior chieftain. And he did not realize at the time that one of the other chieftains hated Islam so much that he was willing to invoke a civil war basically. Right? And we're going to get back to this later on, the repercussions, but for now, we're interested in what exactly happened with Bi'r Ma'una. And so he is saying, send us your best preachers, and I will guarantee them safety in Najd. Now this is a big news. Why is it big news? Because the province of Najd is actually bigger than the province of Hijaz. And the potential of converts... The number of converts that might come about, it will make the entire Islamic dynamics change. And so the Prophet ﷺ chooses 70 of the best of the Qurra and the preachers and the Du'at. Because the potential is too much. And the goal is that these 70 will disperse out. That they're going to go and basically give da'wah in Najd. Because now the green light has been given, the visa has been granted, go and preach. And he chooses the majority of them from Ahl al-Suffa. Because these are the cream of the crop. And Anas ibn Malik, uh, Anas ibn Malik, his uncle went. Anas ibn Malik, his uncle went and he became one of those shaheed. And Anas ibn Malik himself narrates that these people, they were known for their Qur'an. They were known for their tahajjud. They were known for filling up the buckets of the Ansar at night. They would go and fill the buckets up and then go back and sleep in the masjid. You understand there's buckets that you're going to go fill the next day. So they would do it for them. Even though they don't even have a house. They would do it for them. These are the people of the Sufa. Right? And no doubt Allah chooses them for shahada as well. It's a, it's a two-way street. right? That it was a loss for the Muslims. It was a victory for them. Allah chooses the best of them for uh, shahada. So uh, these were the people of the Sufa that they're involved in charity in the day and ibadah at night and Qur'an and dhikr. So the Prophet ﷺ chose sab'een. And that is a huge number for the time. Even for our time, 70 is a lot. For the small city of Medina, we just said in Uhud, there were 700 people that fought. Right? Imagine, if Uhud had 700, you're sending 10% of your men. And that's how much went. Because as I said, this is the province of Najd is almost double the size of Hijaz. And the potential is simply too much now. It's a golden opportunity. And the Prophet ﷺ sensed truth from Abu al-Bara. And Abu al-Bara was telling the truth. Right? Abu al-Bara was not lying. That I give you my word. And as we said, he assumed that the, the other chieftains would respect his word. But they didn't respect his word. So what happened? When the 70 of them got to the well of Ma'una. This is the Bi'r Ma'una. When they got to the well of Ma'una. They sent a letter to Haram ibn Milhan, uh, through Haram ibn Milhan to Amir ibn Tufayl. 
Haram ibn Milhan is the Sahabi. They sent a letter through Haram ibn Milhan to Amir ibn Tufayl. Now Amir ibn Tufayl is the chieftain of one of the local tribes of the region. And Amr ibn Tufayl was one of those arrogant Bedouin chieftains who only wanted to accept Islam if he saw some good in it. And it is said that he had attempted to negotiate with the Prophet ﷺ, either directly or indirectly, had attempted to negotiate a condition for accepting Islam. He had told the Prophet ﷺ, I will accept Islam either if you take charge of the cities and you leave all of the Bedouin lands to me. Half-half. Actually, it's not going to be half-half because the cities are a small percentage. The Bedouin lands are much more. Or if you're not willing to do that, mashallah, he's being reasonable. If you're not willing to do that, then you make me your chieftain after you. After you die, I'm going to take over. Okay? So this was his condition to accept Islam. Now, what do you think? Obviously, you know, we don't have any need for such people, right? And so, uh, the, the, obviously the Prophet ﷺ refused uh, to accept these conditions, so this only made him more arrogant. Now, when Haram ibn Milhan came to Amr ibn Tufayl, and he had with him uh, the letter, and uh, the letter was basically hospitality, we're here for a while, we're just going to go on, and inviting him to Islam is basically generic, you know, uh, you know, information that we are here. Now everybody knows that the Muslims have been given protection. When Amr ibn Tufayl heard that these Sahaba had come from Medina, he made a eye motion to one of his henchmen to kill this guy. Now this is like double or triple, if you like, sin upon sin. Multiple sins. Firstly, he is a messenger. And messengers by unanimous conventions of the world are never harmed. This is, uh, you know, an envoy. You know, as we know, to this day, ambassadors are not harmed. Secondly, even if he weren't a messenger, he has protection from a more senior chieftain. And it is not his duty, Amir's duty, to interfere with that treaty. And in fact, in one book, it even says that the one who gave the uh, initial uh, Al Abu Al Bara was in fact one of the uncles of Amir, which is not too distant to imagine because they're all senior chieftains. So he's a distant uncle or direct uncle, which would make sense as well. So not only is none of his business to get involved in the aman or the safety of another person, he knows that this is breaking a, an agreement that he doesn't have the right to break. And then the third uh, treachery was that he actually did it surreptitiously, he did it secretly. That he made that motion, they must have their codes or whatnot, right? They're, they must have their red phones or whatever it is, you know, or that secret button that they have in our times, whatever it might be. They have their ways. He gives the motion that this guy has to be killed, right? And Amir ibn Milhan had no clue because how is he going to know the motion? And so as he's standing, basically waiting for the audience to be granted to him, from behind, one of the Bedouins comes running with a spear, and if he thrusts it in between his shoulder blades, and it comes right out in front of him. And as soon as he sees this, the first thing on his mind, it blurts out. And what does he say? Fuztu wa Rabb al Kaaba. Basically, I won. I'm a shaheed. Right? Yeah, the first thing that comes to his mind, because that's what happens at that time, that he sees it. His ruh is still in his body. So what comes to his mind? That I won. Alhamdulillah, I won. Meaning I'm a shaheed. Right? So this means this was on his mind. He's making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wants to die a shaheed. He's so excited that he sees his shahada. He actually cries out. That fuzdu, I won. Wa Rabb al Kaaba by the Lord of the Kaaba. And those were his last words. Because that's it, he died. And uh, it is said that one of the people who was there, when he heard this phrase, it caused him to go asking the other Muslims and asking other people, and eventually he accepted Islam because of this one phrase, Fustu wa Rabb al Kaaba. Like, who's gonna win when you die? What type of religion is this that you're happy when the spear is being thrust in and you're crying out for joy? Fustu wa Rabb al Kaaba. Right? And so this actually led to the Islam of one of them. So, uh, Amr ibn Tufayl, Amr ibn Tufayl, he knew he's in trouble now. He's killed a messenger, 
And there are 70 people still there, and he needs to do something. So what does he do? He sends out messages to any tribe that is willing to now join forces with him, and to kill all 70 of these. Because one messenger is not going to be enough now. You're actually going to make things worse by now the 60 or 79 or 60 are still there. So let's get rid of all of them. Khalas, you're going to do one, let's do all of it. So he reached out to other tribes. Quite a number of them refused because they knew that Abu al-Bara had given protection. And so eventually this is going to lead to another clash which will come to later on. For now he's not even thinking two steps ahead. He just wants to kill all of these 70. So finally, three of the sub-tribes they agreed. Asiya, Ra'al and Dhakwan. Asiya, Ra'al and Dhakwan. Three tribes they agreed to join forces with Amir ibn Tufayl and then attack the 70 at Bi'r Ma'una. Okay, the rest of them refused. All of the other tribes of the Najd, they refused because of the protection of Abu al And they said, no, that's not, we're not going to get involved. So, they uh, marched to Bi'r Ma'una, and they surrounded all 70 of them. We don't know the exact quantity, but at least they were around 400-500. Because uh, of all of the, uh, the, the four tribes coming together, uh, you have Amir ibn Zufayl's tribe, and then you have the other three tribes as well. Around 400-500 have surrounded these 70, and... Uh, eventually uh, the Muslims they tried to defend themselves but they hadn't come for a battle they hadn't come with weapons and armor they hadn't come you know armed to the hill they were coming as preachers they were coming as du'at and eventually uh, each and every one of them were killed except for three people out of the 70 except for three people as for one of them Ka'ab ibn Zayd Ka'ab ibn Zayd they wounded him and he fell down and as the bodies continued to collapse on him so he remained wounded, semi-unconscious, and the bodies piled up on him. So they didn't even know there was a person under all of this pile of bodies. And that was Ka'ab ibn uh, Zayd. And uh, Ka'ab ibn Zayd will come back to his story. He dies uh, two years later in the battle of Khandaq. He will die a shaheed in the battle of Khandaq. That's Ka'ab ibn Zayd. Remember his name, we're going to come back to his story. As for the other two, one of them is Amr ibn Umayyah and the other is Al-Munzir ibn Muhammad. Amr and Munzir. And the two of them had gone for an errand, maybe to get some water, maybe for some other issue. They had gone for a few hours for something the camp had sent them. And as they came back, they saw the vultures in the air circling in front of where the Sahaba had camped. And they said, something is wrong, obviously. You're not going to have all the vultures coming, you know, unless there's a feast to be had. They, they said all of these and they said, something is wrong. What should we do? So Al-Munzir, and he was an Ansari, and Amr was a Muhajir. Al-Munzir, uh, and Amr began discussing. Said, what do you think we should do? Clearly there's danger. We don't know what's happening. Should we walk in and then basically kill ourselves as well? Or should we you know, go uh, back to the Prophet So Amr says, I think we should go back to the Prophet in order to tell him that some disaster has happened, some calamity has happened. Clearly, the Sahaba have been killed, the two of us are alive, let's go back and get reinforcements and tell the Prophet what happened. So Amr says, let's go, uh, let's go back. Al-Munzir, the Ansari says, as for me, I will not give up being in the place where my companions have been killed. They were lucky enough to get shahada, I'm not going to give that up and just walk away from that position. And neither do I want, and I, neither do I want uh, other men telling about my story. Meaning, I'm not going to be a messenger that lives to tell their story while they died. I'm not just going to be the, the one who talks about them. I'm not just going to be the uh, uh, the, the storyteller. That I'm going to go and tell their stories while they got the actual benefit of getting shahada or martyrdom. So he in fact encouraged the muhajir to come back with him. And so the both of them, and Mundir and Amr, they both uh, went and they walked in back into, now the massacre is done now. It's, they, they must have gone for a few hours, the massacre has been done. And so uh, the both of them were caught and they were both about to be uh, killed. Uh, eventually, uh, uh, Mundir was in fact killed, because that was his niya, he was in fact killed. And for some reason, uh, Amr was allowed to go back. It is said that, Amr ibn Tufayl, the chieftain, this evil chieftain, it is said that 
either he wanted a messenger to go back, or uh, he said that I have to free a slave uh, anyway, so I'll just choose you to free. The point being, Allah willed that, subhanAllah, the same one who said, perhaps we should go back, Allah allowed him to go back. And the one who said, want to become a shaheed, Allah Azza wa Jal made him shaheed, because you get your niyyah. What you want, you will get it. Right? Neither was a coward, because event- eventually they both walked in. But the one of them wanted shahada. And Allah gave it to him. And the other one was eager to go back. And Allah gave him that as well. And so he uh, went back and this is uh, the one that on the way back, this is Amr now. On the way back, Amr, he, uh, he encountered a small incident which also has some morals and benefits that on his way back to Medina, he met two people from the tribe of Amr bin Tufayl walking back towards Amr bin Tufayl from Medina. So he's going to Medina, they're walking back to Amr bin Tufayl. Right? Now, these two have no idea what's going on over there because they have just come from the Prophet ﷺ and they're going back. And apparently, the both of them had sought protection from the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ had given it to them. But Amr did not know that. And from his perspective, these are two tribesmen from the tribe that has just killed all 70 of my companions. And I don't know what they're going to do. So he tricked them for a while, calmed them down basically, didn't tell them his real identity. When they went to sleep, he got rid of the both. He killed both of them. He killed the both of them. And then he discovered in their possessions a letter of protection from the Prophet wasallam. Because he didn't know any better. He thought these are people from the tribe of Amr ibn Tufayl. I mean, put yourself in his shoes now. It's either him or them. And so he felt extremely bad. He went back and he, he was the one who brought the terrible news uh, of the Prophet ﷺ, to the Prophet ﷺ. And as we said, Al-Waqidi mentions that Al-Raji' and Bi'r Ma'una, they both were received on the same layla, on the same night the Prophet ﷺ received the news on the both of them. So can you imagine... 80 Sahaba, both of them, both groups of them have suffered miserably. They have been literally tortured and massacred to death. And these are all people you know. They're all people that the Prophet ﷺ chose. They're all people that were living amongst them, living in Sufa. Right? Look at the personal ties. You know how the Prophet ﷺ considered the people of the uh, Sufa. And the Prophet ﷺ was greatly grieved. And he prayed every single salah. Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, five salawat. He did a special qunut for all of the shuhada for one month. He made a special qunut in every single salah for one month. And he prayed for the shuhada and he asked Allah Azza wa Jal to take care of, meaning take care, meaning to punish, uh, the qan and ru'al and uh, the Banu Lihyan, which is the Amir with Tufail's tribe, and the Asiya, he, he asked Allah Azza wa Jal to take care of all four of them, means to get uh, rid of them or to punish them. And in fact, this is one of those incidents as well, that uh, Allah Azza wa Jal revealed many verses in the Qur'an, that for wisdom known to him, he then abrogated. Naskhat Tilawa was called. He abrogated those verses. And we still have Remnants of those verses that uh, who will go and tell Man Ikhwanana, who is going to go and tell our brothers that we are safe? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet about them, and verses were revealed that were recited at this time. And this is in Bukhari and Muslim that they were recited at this time, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, abrogated those verses for a wisdom known to him. Now, uh, uh, a number of benefits to derive from uh, the incident of uh, Bi'r Ma'una and even from a Raji' put together. Of them is that we can say that the religion of Islam is not going to be spread without loss, without sacrifice, without even the loss of limb and body and persons. And that loss is going to be bitter and difficult to bear. If this was the case for the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba, then how about in our times? Also notice, compare the two characters. The two characters of Khubayb, the prisoner of war in the last story, and Tufayl, the chieftain in this story. Khubayb has in his hands the baby. And 
He can extract revenge and vengeance. But no, he's not going to do it. Tufail has a messenger who already has protection. And he assassinates him in the cruelest of manners. And such is the way of the heart of Iman with the heart of Kufr. The heart of Iman is a heart of morality. And the heart of Kufr has no morality whatsoever. Notice as well uh, that of the fiqh points that we derive over here, the concept of qunut is something that the fuqaha after this greatly differed over. When does one make qunut? And as you know, each madhab has its position and now is not the time to get into this. But you know that the Shafi'i say in Salat al-Fajr and the Hanafi say in the Witr and the others have their positions as well. But Allahu A'lam, the strongest position is that qunut is not linked to any prayer. Rather, qunut is only done at times of general calamity. Qunut is done when something afflicts the ummah and everybody should make dua for those afflictions. And frankly, this is a sunnah that has been neglected by many, many people. It is a sunnah that has been neglected by much of the ummah. Anas ibn Malik narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after uh, Bi'r Ma'una took place, that the Prophet sallallahu would stand up in the last rak'ah. After the ruku' he would stand up in the last rak'ah. Right? So you've gone to the ruku', then you stand up. And he would make dua qunut for the shuhada and against the uh, tribes that had killed them. So when is qunut done? Qunut is done in the very last rak'ah. At what particular time? When you stand up from ruku'. Right? So when you say, Rabbana wa lakal hamd, then after this, you raise your hands and you make dua qunut. And qunut should be done for any distress or calamity that the ummah is suffering from. And this is something that we should teach our uh, congregations, the Muslim Ummah should know. For example, what's happening in uh, Syria, what is happening in Palestine, anything that might happen in the world, we should make qunut like our Prophet wasallam made. Of the uh, benefits, so therefore in my opinion, and this fiqh issue not related to this, in, in my opinion, qunut should not be done on a daily individual basis. It's not something that is linked to Fajr or to Witr. These are nothing to do with that. You just pray Qunut when the situation arises for the Ummah. This is the what we see here from these Ahadith. Uh, but this is Fiqh and there are different Madhabs as you know. Uh, also of the uh, benefits that we derive is that clearly the Prophet ﷺ did not know Ilm al ghaib He sends 70 here and 10 there. And he did not know that they would die. Even though he can describe the chieftain, and he can do this, and he can do that. What Allah wants to tell him, Allah will tell him. But our Prophet ﷺ does not know unconditional ilm al ghaib There's no question he knew more than any of us. And there's no question Allah taught him things about this dunya and the akhirah, that would be ghaib for us. How could he not have when he went and saw the heaven, and he saw... Min ayat al kubra, and he saw Jibril. So he has seen portions of the ghaib that we have not seen, and of this world as well. He knows aspects of the ghaib that Allah allows or wants to teach him. And Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran, "Wala yuhiyuna bi shayim ilmihi illa bima sha." Whatever Allah wants to teach, He will teach to whomever he pleases. But unconditional ghaib, no one knows other than Allah Azza wa Jal. قُلْ لَا يَعْلَمُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ الْغَيْبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ No one knows the ghaib other than Allah. And this is clear evidence for this. The Prophet was distressed and he sent these people out and yet he did not know what would happen to them. Also, uh, the two people that uh, the Sahabi Amr had killed, the two people that the Sahabi had killed on the way back, the Prophet ﷺ gave blood money to their relatives. And he took responsibility for their death. And this shows us a very, very profound lesson. What lesson is that? Abide by your treaty is true, for is also true. Don't blame 
a person for the crimes and sins of his tribe or people. Which is something very relevant. Collective guilt. Very relevant to our political situation and those who are angry at particular back and forth that are going on. Very relevant. The issue of collective guilt. These were from the tribe of Amr bin Tufayl. They were from the same tribe. But they had not participated, they had no knowledge, they're completely innocent, right? And so, the Prophet ﷺ bears responsibility, he pays the blood money, and it's a mistake, the guy made a mistake, so then he takes responsibility for that mistake. And he pays pays the blood money to the uh, relatives of the the, uh, two people, and this clearly shows that, وَلَا تَزِرُ وَازِرَةٌ وَزِرَ أُخْرَى you're not going to be held accountable for what your tribe has done, what your nation has done, if you are not a part of that. If you don't participate, if you have nothing to do with that. And this is something we notice from this incident as well. And the final point, then inshallah we have some time for question and answer. Uh, the final point, as for Amr bin Tufayl, he died a very pathetic and miserable death, as is to be expected as is to be expected from somebody of such a, a nature, that he was inflicted with a type of leprosy that spread over his whole skin. It started from under the arm and then it spread and uh, it caused him to become delusional and it caused him to become a pariah. His own people left him. When you have leprosy, what's going to happen as you know in those days, right? So he died of extremely painful and miserable death alone in the desert. Uh, And Allah Azza wa Jalla punished him in this world before uh, the next, his own people, his own family abandoned him. He was a crazed lunatic uh, because of this this, uh, filthy disease that uh, overcame him. And this is exactly what is to be expected for someone of this nature, someone whom even the Prophet made dua against. How will this person ever be uh, ever be uh, saved? And inshallah, next week we will do some um, uh, some follow ups as well, uh, and especially the issue of uh, the. Um, Banu Nadir, which is one of those controversial issues again, and um, the the promise that was given for the battle of uh, the battle of uh, Uhud. Remember, at the battle of Uhud, when finished, Abu Sufyan said, "One year later, we're going to do it again." Right? So, inshallah, that we're going to talk about next Wednesday, inshallah Taala. Any announcements to be made? Uh, there are announcements from my side. We are going to be starting Tafsir Surah Yasin, inshallah. Um, Two Tuesdays from now. Can you make a note of that, Danish? Not this coming Tuesday, but the one after that. Right? The person who was buried in the bodies, he made his way back to Medina. He made his way back to Medina. And he died a shaheed in, uh, in the battle of the Khandaq. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the brothers wanted to have Tafsir Surah Yasin. So we're going to be having Tafsir Surah Yasin, inshallah. Uh, on the 12th inshallah at 7.30 and uh, Danish can make a flyer for that and what else there was another announcement wasn't there <laughs> yeah okay um, Q&A but brother Ali where's Ali he's not here the fiqh salah class that was the announcement I remember now the fiqh class the fiqh of salah part 2 that's also going to be taking place I think in 2 weeks so the announcement for that as well inshallah anyway we have a few minutes for questions inshallah Yes. So the Prophet took responsibility for what his people have done. This is something. Uh, no, no. It was because of the aman. But this is something that even in our times, the company takes responsibility for the actions of its individuals, right? And we see this multiple times, that when this is a Muslim who has done a genuine mistake, who's going to pay for this? It's going to be the Muslim community. So because the Prophet gave them protection, and that protection was broken by one of his own, the man is sin, not sinful because he had made a genuine mistake. But in the end, who's going to pay responsibility? It will be the Muslim Ummah. If there was no Aman, what, what, what would be the No, if there was no Aman, then there would not be that type of blood money. But there might have been other types of... Uh, there might have been other types of settlements that would have been done. But these people were protected by the Aman. So by breaking the Aman, you have to pay the full blood money. 
for these two. Okay, yes. You mentioned that the Sahaba during uh, the time of the Prophet, they just had the jihad on multiple occasions. Can you shed some light in the last 19th and 20th century when the door of jihad was closed? What is the historical perspective for all the United States? So the question is, um, there is a lot of talk about the door of Ishtihad having been closed and it was reopened in the 19th century. Uh, this is a bit of a myth. The door of Ishtihad was never closed. And Ishtihad has always been operative in the Ummah and it is one of the signs of a thriving Islamic intellectual heritage. However, what happened was that Certain scholars and what we now call medieval Islam, they felt that all of the scenarios and situations that could possibly take place have been discussed. So there's no need for ijtihad. And so there was this notion now of khalas, everything has been, you know, been there, done, that we've dealt with it. Now, when modernity was thrust upon the Muslim world, when Muslims met face to face with Europeans, when uh, Napoleon invaded Egypt, and then the French came to Algeria, and then the British came to India, and they saw for themselves the radical changes and the differences. So there were a number of trends or reactions. One of these reactions was, one can say somewhat, uh, for every reaction you have an equal and opposite, counter-reaction, right? This is the human nature, right? So when they saw this excess, many Muslims went to the other excess, which is shut yourself off from these people, don't learn their language, don't learn anything from them, and just go back to your textbooks and just pass down the tradition as it came. Right? So in order to stir the hornet's nest, if you like, right, another group said, the door of ishtihad should be reopened. And we should rethink through everything. And this is the other side of the coin. And this is the flip side, which is now, in our times, we would call them progressives. There were no terms back then, right? That lets everything is up for grabs. So in, in India, you had Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan. And in Egypt, you had uh, Muhammad Abdu is the classic example of this, right? Muhammad Abdu, the one who said, I visited England, and I saw Islam, but no Muslims. And I came back to Egypt, everywhere there's Muslims, but no Islam. Right? And frankly, may Allah forgive him and all of us, but clearly there's an inferiority complex there. That you feel their Islam is over there and there's no Islam back in Egypt. And you know, his fatawa are rather... What can I say? You know, they're, they're, they're not quite what we would consider to be... You know, and Muhammad Abdul, I mean, he was that type of mind that just to go ahead. So you had that trend which is the exact opposite, which is let's open up the door and everything up for grabs. Right? And the logical consequence of this is to say that everything is up for grabs. And this is exactly what one of Muhammad Abdu's main students, uh, and that is Abdul Raziq. Abdul Raziq. You should know this then. Uh, he was the minister of Egypt in the 1950s, minister of education. Uh, Taha Abdul Raziq, one of one of Muhammad Abdu's main students, basically came forth and said that all of the laws of Islam were meant only for that tribal society, and we have ultimate now freedom and choice to do as we please. The Prophet was not sent as a lawgiver; he was sent as a theologian to teach us how to pray and fast and wash ourselves in the bathroom. Not to tell us how to have finance and divorce and marriage and inheritance. That's for the tribal system of that time. So far, Ramadan, what does he take? Yeah, the modern people, yeah, well, let's be very careful about modern people. Because modern people, they go back and forth and they change. As for people who have gone on, it's easier to discuss their thought because we know what they, we know what they are about. But I don't mind mentioning uh, um, the particular person you have mentioned because uh, actually he is a good friend of mine. And we get along very well together. And I have nothing but respect for him. Uh, and I don't see him as being any way, uh, shape or form, somebody who lacks respect for the tradition. No, he respects the tradition. But the problem comes, and I have by now you should know this uh, about me and about the type of uh, uh, vision of Islam that I have. 
The problem comes is difficult navigating through both of these extremes. It's not easy. We have on both sides of this spectrum, we have people. We have the ultra-conservative literalists, right? And frankly, they are preaching to a small choir, a small group of people. Their message will never go beyond the people who already are card-carrying members of their groups. You see what I'm saying? Right? Because they don't have a realistic vision for Islam. And then you have the other side, which are basically whatever the Western culture says is good, Islam should also say is good. The West says, democracy, khalas, Islam is fully democratic. The West says, human rights, khalas, human rights. The West says, equality and sexual freedom, khalas, equality and sexual freedom. Right? And this is exactly what we're seeing. That anything that's politically correct or vogue, khalas, Islam also has to have that same vogue characteristic. Right? Islam, as usual, is in the middle. And it's not easy to navigate through And I believe that this individual you mentioned is trying his best to navigate through. That doesn't mean I agree with every single position that he has. But overall, people like this are definitely within the mainstream. Right? And another person, similar type of of, framework and and, and, uh, background, but obviously far more scholarly, is Sheikh Qardawi. Sheikh Qardawi has many issues that I disagree with personally. But I don't ever disrespect him. He's a great alim. And he's trying his best to navigate through the issues here. That when should we remain firm, and when should we, and when should we be, uh, you know, more relaxed or lenient? It's not easy. It's not easy. And this is the big question of Islam of our times. So your. Yeah, it is one of the critiques, yeah. But again, to answer your question simply, so this is the issue of the door of, of ijtihad being shut or open. This is completely vain talk. It was never shut. Nobody has the right to shut it. And nobody has the right to open. It's always been open. Rather, the reason why this talk came up, as we said, a group of people needed to kind of sort of provoke the ultra-conservatives to start thinking realistically. And so they said, we need to open the door of ishtihad again. And therefore this rhetoric tr- you know, filtered down to us as well. But there are plenty of articles and, and research done. This is just kalam fadi. Frank, frankly, it's kalam fadi. What is the door? Where is the key? Who ha- it's all rhetoric. Never was the door of ishtihad closed. It's always been open. And it's always going to remain open. Inshallah ta'ala. That was a completely unrelated question, but... Yani, alhamdulillah, inshallah. Uh, last question, inshallah. Go ahead, bismillah. What, uh, is there a lesson to be learned from maybe not going back and uh, from the back on the two uh, tribes that did uh, this massacre? Or the... Oh, they're going to get a reprisal, don't worry. <laughs> Wait. They're going to get it. Wait. Why you didn't do it right away? Because you need the right manpower to do it. <laughs> <laughs> we ran out of time. <laughs> I've said this many times. Our religion is obviously a perfect religion. There are times to forgive, and then there are times to kick some. You know what? <laughs> and we need to know when to do what. We need. You need to know when to do what. And anybody who always asks for vengeance is gonna execute himself in the process. And anybody who teaches you always have to turn the other cheek will never be able to live up to that himself. And this is what we've seen in the real world. Right? And therefore our religion being that practical, pragmatic, realistic religion, the asal is to forgive. But there are times and there are situations where forgiveness is not good. And treachery is one such time. This is not a personal fault. This is not just one, this is blatant treachery. And this cannot be allowed to pass, and we will see this inshallah uh, later on what happens inshallah. What was the reaction of the chieftain who gave the amount to those 70? Uh, Abu al-Bara. So uh, when he found out that what happened? We don't know when he found out, but we will find out later on that it did cause a bit of a tussle, but we don't know. I haven't found any book that says when the messengers came out as his reaction. We don't know exactly. But he was sincere in the promise. That's the main thing. He did not expect to be, uh, you know, broken. Inshallah. You want to make the announcements?